Okay, I guess that I, I can get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the last talk of the day, the last talk of the conference. I see you all enjoying it. Oh, I'm waiting to go home. Anyway, thank you for, thank you for coming. Um, this was supposed to be a workshop initially when I submitted it, but um, it transitioned to a, to a breakup. Uh, I'll try to do my best. I'm Spanish. I'm Jorge, by the way, Spanish by accent, if you haven't figured out that yet. Uh, I hope you are able to understand everything I said. I, I used to work as developer advocate. Um, when I worked as developer advocate, one of the things that I was doing a lot was trying to help um, developers to use and learn how to use products. And by that, I was engaging with uh, documentation teams a lot. And we were, we were part of the development process. Not too long ago, I transitioned to a software engineering uh, role uh, because I became a contributor to an open source project, which is the one that I'm presenting today slightly. I mean, it's not the, the topic of the, of the breakout, but I'm, I'm, I'm using it as explanation, which is called Educate Training Platform. In 2017, in PyCon 2017, Daniel Prochida, he did a really good talk where he talked about different types of uh, documentation, technical documentation. And he divided that into four different topics. I'm pretty sure that if, that if you are in the technical documentation uh, land, you probably have seen this presentation. If not, you should see it. It's really interesting. And he divided the, the, the type of documentation into four. Tutorials, they are typically oriented towards learning, the learning process, and they should allow the newcomer to get started on the task of whatever he's used to or he, he wants to do. It typically takes the form of a lesson. So in that, in that, um, in that uh, session from Daniele, he used an analogy uh, coming from um, uh, cooking and for tutorials, he used the analogy of teaching a child how to cook. So the, the, the topic of teaching a child how to cook is to get him engaged, to get him wanting to learn more by teaching him how to use the utensils, how to cook, how to, uh, how to manage the different tools in the, in the kitchen, right? So that, those are tutorials. Then there it comes to how to guide, which are more specific towards uh, or, or uh, targeted to a specific goal. They, they need to show how to solve a specific problem and they typically use a series of steps. In this regard, in the same analogy, he uses a recipe. So with the recipe, you see step by step what you can do in a practical way. The third type of documentation that he references is reference documentation, reference guides. They are, toward, they are oriented towards information, providing the user with a lot of information that typically describe the machinery or the things that he will need to to, to know about the, the topic at hand. In this case, in the, in the analogy of cooking, it is like an a encyclopedia article about a specific, uh, specific um, uh, ingredient where you will see the, the chemical uh, components of the, of the ingredient, what are the, timing, the, times, uh, the timings for cooking, the different type of recipes that you can use the, that uh, the ingredient for. And the fourth type of documentation that he gets into is explanation, which is more to get a broader understanding of a specific, uh, a specific area, not a specific topic, but an area at hand that must, must explain. So this, this comes in a form of a discursive explanation. So that means that an example could be an article uh, talking about the evolution of food through history, how it has improved. So giving some opinion of, on things. This type of documentation, typically a written documentation, and, and we know that reading huge amount of documentation to learn, it, it is not, uh, most of the times is very boring. We as humans have learned a lot of things by repetition, by doing things. We have learned how to walk, how to talk, how to uh, run, how to do a lot of things by repetition. So learning by doing is, an easy, is the best way to help anybody absorb the information and to retain it more uh, longer. So the topic at hand is hands-on training. 
Hands-on training refers to software training that involves a practical element. So by trying for themselves something in a controlled environment, a user will be able to get better understanding of how to use, or how, uh, better understanding of what he's trying to learn. There is some challenges when implementing a hands-on training uh, strategy. And one of them, oh, sorry, there is one slide missing. There is some benefits to hands-on training. One of them is that by, by practicing yourself, you enhance the retention. As we said, by practicing, uh, you enhance the retention and the engagement of the user. Also, by practicing real applications that are really, uh, can really easily be bound to your to real world skills, you will probably learn <coughs> better how to do the things that you are trying to learn. It builds confidence because you are using a control environment where if you if, if something goes south there is no repercussions so you can uh, with confidence you can you can do you can learn you can fail you can start again you can go over and you get immediate feedback with with them with what you are trying to do because the the hands-on training is is done in a way that you will whatever you are trying to do is going to be immediately surfaced to you the challenges of implementing hands-on training is typically IT related. So when you decide to when you decide to use a hands-on training platform or a strategy, you will either need to decide whether you go with a vendor that will provide you the hands-on training platform for you and will maintain it to you, or you will go uh, and, or and implement it yourself. So in that in that sense, if you are implementing it yourself, you need to engage with the IT department and start to see how you are going to proceed with that. It's going to incur in some costs because at the end of the day, the platform itself is going to cost some money. So you need to take into account things like how many users I'm going to train, how often, where are they coming from, how long are these training environments going to be running for, how much is the cost for each session, and whether you, you whether it's um, the IT, the or it is justified to go with a hands-on training strategy or not cost-wise. And then you also need to take into account the safety concerns. At the end of the day, if you implement a, a hands-on training platform on your own environment, you need to make sure that that, that hands-on training platform, it is safe enough. It doesn't allow anybody to escape that training platform and access your systems, get into your data. And that, at the same time, you need to make sure that whoever is providing you the hands-on training platform, it keeps it up to date. So there is no vulnerability existing in the platform and things like that. So these are the things that are important to look for in a hands-on training platform. One of them is the user experience. You want to you wanna provide the user an experience that it is easy enough for them to execute without needing to learn how to use the hands-on training platform. You need it to be intuitive. You need to also the experience to give you enough goodies or, or help in order to achieve your task of helping the user learn in an efficient way. You also, because, um, because the, the platforms that exist out there, they are going to be uh, adopted by many different people. You want those platforms to be able to provide your own theme, your own experience on top, right? It is not the same whether you, when you are providing a training site or a documentation, if you have a disjointed experience in the hands-on training, it, it gives the user a really bad feel. And it needs to be extensible and configurable. But that mean, I mean, what I mean is that capabilities need to be um, opt-in or opt-out. There needs to be, depending on which type of, uh, of um, hands-on labs you are going to be delivering, you might need additional functionality that you need to enable on the platform or disable from the platform. So I'm going to show you an example of a hands-on training platform. Okay, so there is a bunch of labs. This is a typical experience, and this is, by the way, this is this is 
a platform that we created with an out-of-the-box experience, which is meant to be themable by the users. And I will show you themes of this experience. When you click on one of the labs of the experiences, what you get is a typical experience that is being proved and demonstrated by many platforms that it was adopted by this project because it's been existing and it's been and, and we know it works. Instructions on the left and then whatever panels you want on the right for you to do whatever you need. And these are composable. You can have multiple different terminals split in different ways. You can have uh, a text editor if you doesn't want to click now. A text editor showing you the, I'll show you another lab. A text editor showing you uh, how to edit files. Um, let's go to the different lab. Uh, I don't know why my No, no it, it is started, but I cannot click in this side. I don't know what, what happened. Anyways, this is the demo, demo effect, yeah. demo yeah. Yeah. This is This is meant to be executed on the browser, but I don't know what happened. I was sitting right there and everything was working fine, but anyway. So let's, let's go with the different experience. So you can see here how this is themed in a different way by, the, by another company that is using the same platform. And Let's see if in their environment it works. So you click on a lab, it loads with their theme because they are they want to provide a, a, a seamless experience with whatever look and feel they have. This is, I mean, if you if you like these colors. So the good is that it has here. You here I can yeah I can click on the editor. Here you will see that an editor will load. There is things like click and run. So I click on this on this text input and I don't need to type it myself so I can improve the, the experience of the user by helping them. These things are opt-in or opt-out whenever you decide as a, as, a, as a content author you want to the user to type, you don't, you don't enable the feature, you want the user to be able to just click and run. So there is a lot of things that you need to look into uh, user experience wise. So, uh, another similar experience, which is a theme and integrated into, into a broader uh, training portal, uh, which is a, talking about Spring developer framework. And this is themed as a Spring. Uh, you'll see their experience. So it is, it, is, it is really important to give the user and uh, of whatever platform you choose, to be able to integrate it seamlessly into your overall documentation experience and give the user a seamless and seamless experience. Second thing that is important it is to look into the sandboxing. And when I say sandboxing, it is that as a user, I want the as a as a content author, I want the user to be able to learn a specific topic. And I, I, for that, I'm going to give them an environment, whether that's a virtual machine or a container or something where they cannot escape. And I will define the size of that sandbox. I will define how many resources that will get. I understand those type of things. They are not typically content authors uh, knowledge. So I don't know as I a, as a, as a write a documentation about how to develop with a Spring Boot. I don't know how many resources a user might, might have. And this is where typically you will have to get some knowledge on the hands-on training platform that you are going to be using. For that, hands-on training platform, some of them, they provide hands-on training on hands-on training. So that means inception. So there is how tos and guides on how to do things on the platform. So you learn. There is other things like I need also to, whenever I, I, I give my user this sandbox, I need in that sandbox something to exist. Whether I'm teaching how to connect to a database, I might need a database to be existing. This database might obviously need to be created as, as part of that, that sandbox. So this is really important whenever you look into, into a uh, hands-on training platform to understand whether they provide this kind of features and how easy it is to use those features. 
Another feature that you need to look into whenever implementing a hands-on training strategy or uh, platform, it is the time boxing. You need to understand that the time these resources are being executed, it is money, right? So you need to you need to be able to constrain the time you are giving the user to use those resources. Because at the end of the day, if you don't unbound this time, what we have seen is that there is crypto miners using this type of platforms to do crypto mining and getting, um, getting money uh, from your money. Different, another thing that we need to look into this type of uh, platforms, it is the time it takes to uh, get a, a lab or a workshop or a tutorial or how to the time it takes for you to be able to execute it. As we have seen in this in this example here, the time wasn't really much. By the way, this is like the default uh, time that you have for executing this this sandbox. Once this uh, this uh, this session, this this lab, this time is finished, all the resources that were created will be automatically reclaimed by the platform and deleted. So there is no cost, no additional cost incurred. And whenever you, the time it takes for a session to start up, as you have seen, it is really fast. But typically it might not be like this. That means that the platform that you, that you select might need, you, might need to allow you to create a pool of sessions or instances of your guide that will sit idle waiting for a user to come in and execute it. So the experience then for them to reclaim, to claim that, that uh, session and, and, and use it, it is minimized. Because sometimes we have seen, I am, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm a learner as well, I have seen that I go to a hands-on learning platform, I click on a workshop and it says, wait two minutes for us to provision your system. And it's like, well, maybe two minutes is it's a lot of time, but maybe I wait. Sometimes you don't even get a notice and it can be up to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever is, is been happening. So this is really something that will drive people away from your hands-on training uh, platform. So that means that you need to make sure that whatever you adopt um, helps you uh, giving good experience on that front. Another thing to look into is the ease of development. Uh, it is especially difficult for authors of content, whether they are, especially when they are uh, technical documentation writers, to develop content in a specific software that is it's meant to work like any, like many development software frameworks, right? Because they are not developers and they don't understand developer, developer practices. So you need to be able to give them some uh, solution that is easy for them to create content. So in this case, the type of um, or the, the, the type of uh, text or, or that the type of markdown or the or uh, media that the, the 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 platform will accept, whether that's ASCII doc markdown, a proprietary thing. How do you create that? Whether you put it into a database, whether you put it into an LMS, whether you put it into a Git uh, repository. So that is, again, things to consider whenever you look into a content, uh, on, to a hands-on training platform, because at the end of the day, whoever is going to be writing that content, is, it, it will need to follow whatever development practices will need to be followed or will, will be in place for, for that. For that, you need to look into, can I run this locally? Do I need to use a platform that is maybe hosted somewhere? Can I access that? Maybe I'm at home and I want to write a piece of content, a hands-on guide. Can I access that? If it's running in, my in the environment in my, in my company, can I access that through VPN? Or can I maybe spin up a local environment locally on my laptop and, and develop the content and whenever I'm done, has put, put, published the content somewhere. The workflow for authors also, whether you are not only the, the content itself or, or the authoring, not only it, uh, touches the text itself, it also touches the definition of the hands-on training uh, that you are delivering. At the end of the day, the text is part of it, is 
probably part of the most critical thing that you are uh, writing, but also the things that will be required. How do you define those? I need a database. How do I define that I need a database? So whatever, whenever I, I create my virtual environment, the database is up and running. What are the prerequisites to that? And then whether you can have that content upgraded in an automated way. So I create a new version of content. I push a change because uh, God knows why I, I use a Spanglish version of, uh, of a word and I need to use the, the proper English version or whatever. If I make a change, how long it will take for that change to be uh, live in, into your platform so that the user can see that um, can, can see that change immediately. So whether there is workflows for content versioning, how do they work? Those are the type of things that you need to look into uh, whenever you adopt a uh, hands-on training platform. The scalability of your platform. At the end of the day, one of the most important things when you when you go with a platform, it is money. And those those three uh, those three topics uh, at the end they are all related in a way because. How scalable is a platform? At the end, it will also tell you how much money you are going to spend on the, on the platform. If I if I want to deliver, if I want to provide con, uh, the hands-on experience to forty concurrent users, how much that will cost me? Is it easy to provide that experience for forty users? At the end of the day, that has relation with is the environment where this uh, where this platform or is the platform that I'm running being able to do multi-tenant sessions or, or training uh, concurrently to how big amount can I then also deploy different versions of, of the content depending on how the user or where the user is coming from. One of the things that happens uh, with uh, locality is that if you have a platform in the US and you are coming from Australia which has a slow bandwidth in the internet, the experience that you have might be might be slow. So whether you can have this this platform distributed and running in different in different environments is also a thing to take into account. Whether you are implementing your own or whether you are going with a with a vendor that provides you this functionality. Security. This is really important. The security is, is really important. Not to the person the people that write content typically we don't we often don't look into how secure a platform is. But when you talk to the IT people or, or your managers to, to tell them, hey, I, I need to implement this, this platform to, to, te to teach my, my learners, one of the key things is if you are going to implement it on premises, is how secure that is. Because if they access my systems, I'm screwed. And you need to make sure that whatever platform that you are using, it is transparent enough to tell you how often they upgrade, what are their, require, their, their security considerations, constraints, and what are they based on to make some, or to create some confidence in you. And, and lastly, uh, the, the last thing that is typically very important whenever you are implementing a hands-on training platform is the cost that it will take. At the end of the day, you need to weigh whether the cost that it will cost, the cost it will take to train 50 people per day on a specific topic, whether it's worth the value that you're putting into a, into a solution. If you go with a vendor, they typically might charge you for a fixed cost, a fi uh, cost per execution plus cost per user. So that means that if you have a, a user base of 5,000 people and they execute 5,000 labs per, per month, you will get a cost of X, Y, Z. Right. If you do it on yourself, the cost it takes is the infrastructure that you are going to use, the people that is going to manage that infrastructure, and then obviously there is no cost per user because at the end of the day that is that is um, really uh, covered by the by the cost of op operation, internal operations. Uh, so given that we are in the in OSS summit. Uh, this, this platform that I show you is open source. One of the things that I've always been advocating for is to use open source software. Doesn't mean that, um, obviously, this is a nice platform. Whenever you look into a platform, try to see whether you can use open source and favor open source uh, developers, because that will make the world a better place to be. 
and here there is a link for for the platform if you want to look into it there is educates.dev this is this is a platform that is really easy to use but whatever platform you choose just be advised or be or make sure that giving hands-on training or providing a hands-on training platform for for learning experiences it is always amazing because it helps learners to get knowledge faster and and retain it better and with that i'm open to questions is there any question Thank you for great presentation, really great <laughs> wrap up and something that is different from traditional docs that we have been talking through all day. Um, I have two questions. I can probably go one by one. Um, um, what is the, from your perspective, the problem that should stand in front of me? So I would um, think, okay, probably the hands-on training is better than the traditional like web-based doc in that case. So the, are there any specific maybe signals that you probably need to do like more practical tutorial hands-on training rather than just write traditional docs yeah so one of the things i i, I saw another presentation and i think this this has been given here again uh, about the google summer of code or or docs and they talk about code um metrics there is like Dora metrics about your, your docs metrics. There is Dora metrics about your docs. So you need to be able to measure the quality of your docs. Whatever, uh, whatever type of approach you follow, whether it's traditional reading approach, how do you know how many people is using reading your docs? So typically in a, in a, in a traditional like LMS, you might be able to see how many people engages with your pages, how far deep they go, how much time they spend. This will give you some type of uh, measure of um, how good your documentation is performing. Depending on that, if you want to accelerate the, if you feel like um, there is not so, so much engagement, hands-on training typically helps you accelerate that uh, training because it is more targeted to a specific topic than the documentation. Uh, Doing a, one of the one of the key problems were, that I found is that going through a how to guide, for example, without a, an experience like this, means that I'm sometimes I need to get access to a system or install something on my laptop. Hell, I got uh, my laptop locked down by my, co my my company. I cannot install a VM. Those kind of things are typically leading to. Uh, an online experience where everything is sandbox is tested, you have a repeatable experience. It's like, you know that it works and it will always work, except today, obviously. <laughs> Sorry for the demo gods. Uh, it should work and, uh, and it's repeatable. So anybody will get the same experience, will go through. And also you, you need to measure the, the execution of that because at the end of the day it's not magical hands-on training it is more targeted and it helps people absorb and be engaged with the with experience but some how-to guides or some guides some lessons might not be the right ones might not be written in the in the right way so you again need to have some metrics measuring how well is your your guides performing because at the end of the day these type of things require maintenance you are if you are into documentation maintaining documentation every time there is a new release of the product it is really time consuming so knowing which documentation performs good it is critical to focus on the on the, the only only the one that really works the other one just throw it away and find something else thank you and the second one, um, I work at JetBrains, so we do IDs. Yeah. You maybe heard of? Of course. <laughs> yeah. A few, or at least IntelliJ ID, probably, or PyCharm. Uh, and I was wondering that, um, given an online experience is good, as you have mentioned, that they don't need to install anything locally, they don't mm. need to have the whole environment there, which can be like lots of dependencies. But at the same time, they will be working in the IDE when they were like done with the tutorial, with the hands-on sure. tutorial, and then they need to switch. Have you been like, have you seen any examples or maybe you have been trying to incorporate the same experience to the IDE? Because this is the, the environment they will be working afterwards. 
Sure. One of the things that I've seen, and, and our platform allows you to that in, in a specific, in a certain way. This platform is, is built on, on containers running on Kubernetes, so the, 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 like the orchestrating engine be, behind, behind the scenes is, is Kubernetes, and it uses the editor that it uses is VS Code or Coder. And the thing is that running a container for specific things can be run on a remote platform like Kubernetes, but can be run locally on Docker. So you, you can have the same experience running locally on Docker with the hands-on training. Again, I, I see your point where, well, if, what if I want to deviate from this, I need to install things. That is something that you will need to guide through uh, reference documentation, reference guide on how to do things. And it is impossible to cover all the, all the, topic, all the, all the possibilities because it's, it's impossible. And this is one of the reasons we created this initially is when we were developer advocates, we were doing workshops at conferences. We were spending like half of the time helping the users get their environment up and uh, set, set up. And we were not able to train about what we wanted to train, right? We were talking about a specific, how to use a specific product and they were failing. So at the end of the day, the, the workshop was, was finished without us being able to deliver whatever content we deliver. So the, the hands-on training platforms at the end of the day, the goal for them is to know how to do a specific task. Obviously, there will be variations that you cannot cover and the user might, might need help in some other way. Any other question? Okay, then thank you for coming and